Hello and welcome to my channel, Vice Rhino here. Today I saw that Genesis Apologetics uploaded a new video, which I don't typically get excited about because their new videos are often just old videos spliced together in a different order, and usually I find that I've already covered them. But today it looks like all new material. Well, as new as creationist material gets. There's no new arguments in it, but at least it's a fresh presentation of old arguments. So let's take a look. Natural history museums and school textbooks display human evolution trees or march of progress infographics that supposedly show humans evolving from ape-like creatures over millions of years. Sorta kinda. It's a developing field of study, so what they are actually showing is our current understanding of the potential human evolutionary lineage. When looking at these graphics over the last 100 years, it becomes really obvious how inconsistent these lineups have been over the generations. Like I said, it's a developing field. We have a lot more information today than we did in 1915 or 1927. Consider Piltdown Man, or Eoanthropus Dawsoni, which was based on a skull found in 1912. Good old Piltdown Man. Yeah, we know it was a hoax, and it's a bit embarrassing how long it stuck around in the literature for, but it bears mentioning that scientists were skeptical of Piltdown Man from as early as 1913, just one year after it was officially presented. Even so, in the paper that the 1927 phylogeny that you're showing was taken from, you can see that Piltdown Man is the outlier, he's off to the side, not quite fitting in. The authors of that paper expressed surprise at the size of Piltdown Man's brain, noting that it is similar in size to some modern humans, with some early 1900s racism showing through in their comparison to the Indian Veda tribes, when in reality modern human brain sizes can range from anywhere from 975 cubic centimeters to 1500 cubic centimeters, with Europe Europeans averaging close to the 1240 centimeters found in Piltdown Man. This was thought of as the official missing link between ape and man. Yes, some did think of it that way. Scientists who lived over a century ago were wrong about something is hardly surprising news. And portrayed in classrooms, textbooks, and museums as one of the leading proofs of human evolution. Yep, it sure was. Bear in mind that this was not a universal opinion, with many leveling criticism against it, but a lot of people did think that it was. But take a look at the Piltdown Man timeline from Wikipedia. Yeah, I know Wikipedia isn't a fantastic source, but it's generally reliable enough for mundane details like this. So, in December of 1912, Piltdown Man is officially presented. Then in 1913, it is pointed out by David Watterson that it is made up of an ape mandible and a human skull. Then in 1915, it is again concluded that it is an ape mandible and a human skull. Then in 1923, it is reported that it is a modern human cranium and an orangutan jaw with filed down teeth. Then, in 1925, a geology error with regards to the find is reported and ignored. And finally, it is openly exposed as a hoax in 1953. The real question is, why did Piltdown Man last so long? Well, one reason is that the chemical tests that ultimately exposed it as a hoax weren't developed until the 1940s. Another reason was the Eurocentric view of European scientists of the late 1800s and early 1900s. They had a hard time conceiving of the origin of intelligent human beings as being anywhere outside of Europe, and since in Piltdown Man they had what they thought of as a European human ancestor, they sometimes tended to disregard some of the important finds that were coming up in Africa and Asia. But ultimately, it was these other fossil finds that sealed the deal. With each new specimen, it became increasingly clear that Piltdown Man was the odd one out. And given its history of sometimes being considered two separate specimens, one of an ape mandible and one of a human skull, it was decided to examine it more closely. And once the appropriate chemical tests were developed, it was found that the skull was a human skull from about 500 years ago, and the mandible was only a few decades old. So, rather ironically for the creationists, if we hadn't started piecing together human evolution from real fossil finds, then Piltdown Man would likely have been considered a legitimate specimen for a lot longer than it actually did. But you'll never hear a creationist tell you the story of how we figured out it was a hoax. They'll just tell you that it was, and heavily imply that this means that there are other hoaxes that we haven't discovered yet. Which, yeah, I suppose is always a possibility, but given the fact that Piltdown Man likely set the study of human evolution back by several decades, I don't imagine most scientists would be content to continue with a hoax rather than exposing it, so any hoaxes would have to be pretty much perfect. And the fact that different teams of people have found different specimens of several 
hominid ancestors independently makes this all that much more difficult to pull off. And, you know, the whole chemical testing thing has advanced quite a bit, not to mention the rigorous documentation of any finds that are now essentially prerequisites to publication in any reputable journal, and about a million other reasons why pulling off such a hoax today is next to impossible. It was even on the front cover of leading evolution textbooks for decades. Yeah. Textbooks teach the currently understood body of scientific knowledge, and the time when Piltdown Man was accepted as a genuine specimen, it was part of the currently understood body of scientific knowledge. And had it actually been legitimate, it would have been an incredibly significant find, worthy of being on the covers of textbooks. So given that they didn't know that it was not legitimate, it is completely understandable that textbook publishers would include it on the cover. However, it was exposed in 1953 as a forgery, after carrying the role of missing Link for 41 years. And like I said, it was the fact that it was increasingly obviously an outlier that eventually outed it as a hoax. A fact that relied 100% on our increasing understanding of human evolution. If evolution were some big conspiracy with scientists lying to promote it, Piltdown Man never would have been outed by these scientists as a hoax. Java Man, or Pithecanthropus erectus, also played its role in the lineup, even though it was based on just a single tooth and a skull cap and thigh bone found about a year apart and 50 feet from each other in East Java. You mentioned them being found a year apart and somewhat physically separated, as though that were some oddity in paleontology. It's not. That is quite normal. But yeah, Java Man, found in 1891 and 1892, and heavily contested, with some scientists insisting it was just an ape specimen and others insisting it was just a human specimen. It wasn't until the 1950s that it was reclassified as Homo erectus and placed in the human evolutionary lineup, and this reclassification included more individual specimens than just the original femur and skull find. So I feel like you trying to throw shade at the original type specimen is just an attempt to ignore the literally dozens of individual Homo Homo erectus specimens that we have, including at least one nearly complete skeleton. Numerous museum exhibits and statues were made of this creature around the world. Yeah, probably. I failed to see a problem. Java Man toppled in the 1930s and 40s, when other experts studied the bones and reclassified them as Homo erectus. How exactly is that a toppling of the find? It had been unclear up to that point where exactly the Java Man specimen fit in, but as we found more specimens and were able to collect more data, it became apparent that Java Man was a member of the same group as these other specimens, and that group is Homo erectus. A label given to fossils that are simply human, but vary in shape and size as humans still do today. Yes, everything in the category Homo is, scientifically speaking, a human being. Now, for convenience, I will henceforth be referring to modern Homo sapiens as humans when making comparison to other human species without making this distinction, but it is an important distinction to be aware of. So there are several different human species that are distinctly different from modern humans. Homo erectus, which we're talking about now, had a brain size ranging from 546 cc to 1,251 cc. That is a much greater range of variation than is found in modern humans, though gorillas have a similarly broad range. And while their brains could get as large as the human brains, their overall average brain size is quite a bit smaller than other humans. And when we look at a human skull and a Homo erectus skull side by side, it becomes rather obvious that they had much more pronounced brow ridges, their jaws stuck out further, and they had a more pronounced sagittal keel, which is the ridge up the middle of the skull where the sagittal bones meet. So yeah, Homo Homo erectus was a human species, but they definitely were a different species from modern humans. It seems like people who want to believe in evolution are quick to jump on the smallest amount of evidence that support their theory and run with it. Nah, if I was going to just grasp onto any tiny bit of evidence, then you'd have seen me make a video about lice by now. You see, humans are rather unique among mammals in that we host several distinct species of lice. Pubic lice, which live in your pubic region, obviously. Head lice, which stick mostly to the head. And body lice, which live in your clothing and bedding. Our loss of body hair in our evolutionary past created a physical barrier between the lice down under and the head lice, allowing for a speciation event. And then our development of clothing created a third environment where a third species could evolve. And all of these lice share their common ancestor with gorilla lice, meaning that the human ancestors that lived about three million years ago were in close enough contact with the gorillas to have shared lice with them. 
Through an examination of these lice, their genomes, and a comparison with modern gorilla lice, we have actually been able to figure out certain minor aspects of human evolution. And no, we probably did not share the gorilla lice through sexual contact, as easy as it would be to make the pubic lice jokes here. And now that I have everyone scratching their heads with a case of psychosomatic lice, we can move on. Publishing volumes about such scant evidence, this is still true today, with paleo experts being incredibly motivated and well-funded to discover new fossils that paint the ape-to-human connection. Your little chart there is a bit off. So, from top to bottom on that chart, we have a list of four specimens, Piltdown Man, Java Man, Nebraska Man, and Neanderthals. From left to right, we have first what evolution supposedly taught about it, how long it was taught for, and then what it is now. Piltdown Man was taught to be a missing link between humans and the other apes for 41 years, but is now a known fraud. That's correct enough for me to not worry about it. Java Man was taught to be the missing link between humans and the other apes for 48 years before being reclassified as human. That is misleading at best. Java Man is the name of a specific specimen, which in this case is a member of the species known as Homo erectus. It was highly contested when it was first found, with scientists unable to decide whether it was more representative of apes or humans. And, of course, disclaimer here, yeah, humans are apes, but again, for the sake of convenience, you can assume that I am aware of this fact when I talk about humans versus apes. So, for decades, some scientists were insisting that the Homo erectus specimens were human, while others were insisting that they were apes. In 1950, 59 years after its discovery, scientists agreed to place specimens of this species into the Homo erectus category, a officially marking them as human, though certainly a distinctly different species of human than we are. Next comes Nebraska Man, the tooth from an extinct species of pig found in Nebraska in 1922, and claimed, not necessarily maliciously, but rather mistakenly, to be an ape closely related to humans. This find was never widely accepted, and the drawing of Nebraska Man that creationists loved to bring up was heavily criticized, even by Dr. Henry Osborne, who was the first scientist to examine the tooth. He called the drawings a figment of the imagination of no scientific value and undoubtedly inaccurate. Then, in 1927, five years after its classification as an ape, it was demonstrated to be a mistaken classification when they found the rest of the pig that the tooth came from. And finally, we get to Neanderthals, a species which is so closely related to us that they managed to breed with us. But there are certain genetic markers that suggest that a human-Neanderthal hybrid was likely to have fertility problems, particularly males. We have managed to sequence the Neanderthal genome, and we have found the distinct remnants of this genome within the human genome, so we know that they bred with us, and yet they have a genome that is distinct from ours. Whether Neanderthals are a subspecies in the same category as us, or a completely separate species with which we could hybridize, is a matter for debate. But that's why you sometimes see Homo sapiens sapiens, rather than just Homo sapiens, to distinguish us from Homo sapiens neanderthalensis. And our difficulty in making this classification comes down to the fact that it is hard to define exactly what a species is. And the reason it is hard is because evolution happens. Because there are gradients between the different species, it's hard to put the species into arbitrary boxes. If creation were true, though, we would expect these boxes to not be arbitrary. We would expect to be able to group things together definitively. But we can't. Today, you won't find a single human evolution tree or lineup that leading paleo experts will agree on. Well, let's just take a look at a few of these phylogenies then. The first one you showed is from the Smithsonian Institution, which shows the Artipithecus species living from roughly 4 to 6 million years ago, the Australopithecus living from roughly 2 to 4 million years ago, Paranthropus from 1 to 3 million years ago, and Homo from now to about 2 million years ago. And with the way the tree is set up, it seems to indicate that these groups are all related, but that none are the direct descendants of the others. Next up is the one from Encyclopedia Britannica, which shows Australopithecus living from about 1.5 to 4 million years ago, and Homo living from now to about 2.5 million years ago. It does not include Paranthropus or Artipithecus, and it doesn't even attempt to show relatedness, instead just giving a timeline of when they lived, and given the imprecise nature of these particular graphics, they match closely enough to essentially be saying the same thing. Next up, I've pulled one from Berkeley's Understanding Evolution website, which has Artipithecus living 4 to 6 million years ago, Australopithecus living from 2 to 4 million years ago, Paranthropus from 1 to 3 million years ago, and Homo from now to 2.5 million years ago. Again, the timeframes line up, but this one actually has it laid out to show relationships. And again, it does not claim direct ancestry for any of the groups. 
And finally, I pulled this one from the University of Michigan, which is harder to read than the others, but it gives the same general time frame as all the others, with the species all in the same order. And again, if you look at how they connect the lines, they are not claiming direct ancestry for any of these groups. So I see several different groups with their own phylogenies that all agree with each other, despite the fact that you said they wouldn't agree with each other. But we can look at a few that have been published in leading sources. This one was prepared by Professor Klein at Stanford and was published on the 200th anniversary of Darwin's birth to show how much we've learned about human evolution since Darwin's time. Now, he's about to pick apart all the unknowns in this chart, and since PNAS is an open access journal, it's easy enough to check the source in this case. So let's see if they are indeed trying to hide a lack of data while still maintaining a phylogeny as though it's supposed to be perfectly accurate, as he seems to be implying. When reading through the paper, a few things become clear. Firstly, this paper is not really trying to prove anything, it's simply a quick summary of what we have learned about human evolution since Darwin's time. Secondly, it doesn't even attempt to present this phylogeny as if it is supposed to be the final say on the matter, instead describing it as a phylogeny that most authorities would probably accept as a reasonable working hypothesis. Notably, if we look at the phylogeny they present, the timeframes for the various groups all match up with all of the other phylogenies we've looked at so far. But this paper is talking about what we've learned of human evolution, so it makes some guesses about actual ancestry, saying that we likely descended from one of the Australopithecine species. So really, what it comes down to is the fact that scientists are honest about the fact that we do not know whether a specific species we find in the fossil record was the actual exact species that we descended from, or if it was a cousin to the species we descended from which might have existed that we are as yet unaware of. So any phylogeny that displays actual direct descent will either be misleading or they will be honest and mark down where the unknowns are. Will they find something to complain about other than the scientists being honest about what they do and do not know for certain? To find out, tune in tomorrow, same Rhino time, same Rhino channel.